about you folks, but I'm getting a little sick and tired of these uh, juveniles who like to go out and steal your cars or, or if not outright steal your car, make it very uncomfortable for you when you get up in the morning and go out and try to start your car and find out that it's on cinder blocks or that somebody has rummaged through your car in the middle of the night. Oh, and by the way, did you lock your doors? Hey, good morning. It's Gary Byron. 11 minutes after the hour of 8. 811 on this Monday morning, the 5th of April. Glad to have you on board the morning train here. Our next guest into the Daily Connerton Memorial Company interview chair is a state senator serving his second term. He's also a uh, a former police officer, I believe in the town of Vernon. And uh he's also the uh, not only is he a former police officer in the town of Vernon, not only is he a state senator, he's also the mayor. <laughs> wow, great to have him back. Let's welcome Dan Champagne. Dan, are you there? Good morning. Yes, good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm not doing too bad. Nice to hear your voice this morning. How are things with you? Busy. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> it's never a dull moment, is it? Never. Um, so in addition to being mayor and state senator and you're a former police officer, and I know that last week in the Judiciary Committee, which you serve on, uh, they held a public hearing in the issue of juvenile vehicle thefts. So I, I, I no one better to talk to really than you right now. First, if you can, uh, talk about these thefts and why they are occurring and so frequently in not just your community, but all of our communities. Well, let's start with the base, the, what's going on in Connecticut in general. Essentially, uh, number one, if, in order to go to jail in the state of Connecticut, you really have to work at it. <laughs> oh, it, it, is, it is not an easy thing. And, and I keep trying to make that point over and over and over again. Uh, when they're passing laws to um, basically make it easier for criminals to, to stay out of jail. Um, and I don't think they quite understand that. But right now, across Connecticut, we have what's known by many as car shopping, which means uh, we get groups of people who will walk around looking for your car that's unlocked, or if you leave something valuable that they can break the window and, and, and just take what they want and off they go. And the other thing is that they're stealing the cars. Uh, which is becoming more and more frequent. But again, because it's so difficult to go to jail, they're basically stealing the car, stealing what, what's in the car. If they do get arrested, it really, it, it's it, especially with COVID going on right now, they, they don't expect to really go to jail on this. So then what message does that send, Dan? Because it, there used to be a time when a cop would say, yeah, you're going to jail. And <laughs> if somebody ever said that to to I don't know, to anybody like, yeah, right, buddy, you know as well as I do I'm not going to jail, you know. Pretty much that's what they would say to us. Yeah. And, and they're right. And, they, and they're right. And the cop knows they're right. So what do you do? What do you say? What do you – you can't even arrest them. You know, what? basically I would never look at the results of my cases. I would make my arrest. I would make my case and, and never look because it is. It's disheartening. Um, and, I mean – especially some cases that you work months on putting the whole thing together and, and then you go and you look and, and they got probation and they are already on probation for the exact same charge. So, you know, <laughs> when the next you know. case comes along, you know, you're just doing the work and uh, it, it's disappointing, but you know, with the laws that are out there right now and, and what's coming out of uh, what's being handed down from the top, I mean, I mean you, you do the best you can. So there really is no law and order, Senator, is what you're saying. I said it during the hearing last week. I said, you, in the state of Connecticut, you commit the crime, you don't do the time. You know, it, it, it's a reverse of what it used to be. And what message does that send the criminal? <laughs> they just keep offending. Yeah. I think in your, yeah. just before we started talking, I, I heard that you were talking about a gentleman who was arrested for a seventh time, but yeah. he's got 12 pending cases in Connecticut right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well. <laughs> that's, that's pretty regular. You know, one of the points I, I like to make is when I first started as a policeman back in 1990, that I found a guy that had 17 arrests and it was, and we, you know, as we were looking at it like, wow, look at this guy. He's been arrested 17 times. When I left, it was not uncommon to find somebody who had 70 or 80 arrests. That's and, and crazy. That's the problem. Well, 
Well, you know, with the fact that the state is closing down prisons, I mean, that in and of itself sends a message. Yeah, it does. And, and you know, they, they would love to say that, it, you know, it's, it's less crime, but it's not. And, you know, it, it's there's so many diversionary programs, which are great if they work. And, and ways to stay out of jail. And then you, you have um, the plea bargains. Uh, you know, I don't blame the courts. The courts, they're overwhelmed enough. And But at some point we have to say, and we have to do a more comprehensive study is what I think. And that study has to include the arrests being made, the, the consequences of those arrests. Um, how, you know, the offender, instead of looking at the recidivism rate as going to jail, look at the recidivism rate as, as, as being arrested. You know, we, we've got to dig a little deeper and show that there is a big problem in Connecticut, and we've got to solve it. We're talking with uh, State Senator Dan Champagne. I, I it, it, with the message that it sends to your constituents when they sit there and they read what's happening. Like, heck, they didn't have to read what's go what's happening. All they need to do is open up their eyes because if it hasn't happened to them, it's happened to their friend, their family, their coworker, their neighbor. And I guess by the law of averages, well, eventually it'll get around to happening to them. How do you go back and look them in the eye as a state legislator? And and I, Dan, I, I don't, I'm not setting you up here. I'm a, you know, I'm a former state legislator myself, mm-hmm. serving a couple of terms in the house. Um, and I, so I'm asking you this in a, in a friendly manner, not to, you know, I'm not trying to give you the business here, but how do you go back to your constituents and look them in the eye and say, yeah, I'm a state legislator, I'm a lawmaker, and uh, yeah, we're letting these people free, and uh, they're getting a slap on the hand, and uh, how do you tell that to somebody? Well, I I have no problem telling it because it's not the it's it's not the minor party in Hartford that's doing it, mm-hmm. you know. And on one hand, here here we are trying to deal with these the the motor vehicle thefts and the rest of it. But if you look at the bigger fi- picture, there's a lot of other laws being presented right now that that basically want to erase charges, um, want to um, basically uh, make it easier to to stay out of jail, <laughs> and, and it's already it's it's. Like I said, it, it's really hard to go to jail in Connecticut. Yeah, we're, we're also, folks, we're also uh, broadcasting on Facebook Live. Robert is on Facebook Live, and he says 12 pending cases, but yet made, I can't read that, $830,000 bond. Uh, yeah. More to that, yeah, more than more to that than meets the eye. So, well, how do you explain that one, too? They're, they're, they're paying their, they're paying $830,000 bond. Right. 12 arrests. Really, what's going to happen to that person? I, since you brought it up, that was at the top. And what he's doing, folks, is, is uh, Senator Dan Champagne is referencing something that we air at top of the hour. We, As you know, we do a Fox News break. It comes over from the Fox News uh, feed that we get um, at the top of every hour. And um, and then we also do some local news that, uh, that pertains to the state of Connecticut. And one of those stories had to do with that. I just wanted to bring our listeners up to date in case uh, in case they missed that part. But no, but how do you how do you um, keep that in perspective? How does that even allowed to occur? Twelve arrests. Well, well, you know, what? I don't think a lot of people realize what's going on. You know, I mean, I mean, 12 arrests. It's got seven previous charges. I mean, look at the people that have 80 arrests. You know, oh, oh. And, and, you know, when we talk about this new juvenile law that just passed and, and personally, anytime we try to tighten up the laws, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for it. But if you actually dig down into that law, you know, one of the I mean, section one of this new law um, basically says that if you entice a juvenile into breaking these laws, which is great because that happens a lot, um, that you can be held responsible. And and they're talking about um Anybody under the age of 18. So, you know, gang members will use people under the age of 18 to commit the crimes because they know, you know, it's difficult to go to prison as an adult in Connecticut. It's even more difficult as a juvenile. Near impossible unless you commit some really serious offenses. But, you know, basically, when you go through that law, um, you have the enticing of of the the juvenile. And then when you go down to... um, Uh, A little further, it it talks about uh, the child, you know, they can be held accountable now if they have two or more felony offenses Mm. uh, that have been on their record. Mm. So, I mean, how many felony offenses is it going to take before we we decide, okay, now's now's the time to 
to put this law into effect. You know, and, and again, I don't blame the court system because the court's overwhelmed. No, and that's um, the golden question. How many how many times will it take for somebody to finally get arrested? When you said 80, I mean, I take it yeah. you were not exaggerating that number. There are people with 80 oh, no. arrests this, and, and they're walking this, the streets? This, oh, yeah. There's, there's more than you think out there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and this is, you, you know, when you get into the cities, I mean, the cities deal with 400 cases a day in their court systems. And, you know, you, you're not going to have a trial on 400 cases a day. And, and, and in some cases, they actually have more cases than that. So, you know, they're, they're, pretty, they're overwhelmed with what they're doing. Um, and, and like I said, it, it, if there's no punishment for the crime, then what's going to stop you? Dan, I'm curious. How many states have these loose of laws where somebody could break into someone's car uh, in the middle of the night. These juveniles, uh, and actually, they're not all juveniles, though. Let's be fair. There are no, some. Not. There's adults as well that are breaking into cars in the middle of the night. They are either stealing tires and putting their cars up on cinder blocks, or or they're rummaging through uh, trying to find some of uh, something of value in the interior of the car, if not downright stealing the car. How many other states have such loose laws as the state of Connecticut? There's a few. There's, you know, I mean, again, you know, you're talking about, you know, some an overwhelming number of arrests in, in, in a lot of different states. But there are some states that actually, uh, you know, send the prisoners to jail. And uh, I think those are a lot more effective. Uh, you know, I think, you know, somebody called me the other day. Uh, it was a victim's group in Connecticut and said, what can we do to, to stop this? And I said, you know, you got to speak out. When we're having these hearings mm-hmm. on race and charges and, and, and making it easier for people to stay out of jail, we need the victims to speak because that's the biggest part we're missing. During this, ju- this juvenile law being passed, one of, my, one of my constituents actually testified and was talking about um, when a, a group of juveniles, juveniles and adults, basically were stealing cars in, in Tolland, and, mm-hmm. and one of them put a gun right to his head. Oh, so this is what we need. We need the victim stories. We need the victims to come in there and say, this is what happened to me. You need to get tough on crime. Oh, well, um, and that's... basically you can write it. You can write it in or you, or you can actually testify. No, it's better to testify. I, I mean, writing it in. I used to read some of them. and I couldn't get to all of them. But when someone was testifying uh, and I didn't have to go through the Zoom, I was my my two terms. I had a I was a, on, the, on the committee and. I would see the emotion in in their face. I would see their ex- facial expressions. I would hear, mm-hmm. you know, their the, the emotion in their voice. You know, I saw the gestures that they would make. It had a greater impact on my heartstrings and and on the various committees that I was serving. On, I'm just curious though. What do you think is fair? Um, do you th- believe that a first time offender? Should get, especially if they're a juvenile, should they get a slap on the wrist? And I'm talking about first time, maybe some rehabilitation and saying, all right, listen, we don't want to screw up your future here because if we arrest you, this is going to go on your record. And I think you have prom, you, you may have some promise. I don't want to screw that up for you, but this be a warning, you know? Um, so maybe a first time offender, you get a slap, but anytime thereafter, what, what would be a fair uh, a process in your opinion? Well, number one, you got to judge it by the crime. Okay. Um, okay, obviously, that's any, any, anything very seriously has to be taken seriously. But for minor offenses, uh, the first time arrest, um, you know, we have a juvenile review board where they actually hand down sentences more than the court does. Oh. So uh, this is in the town of Vernon. And a lot of, town, a lot of towns have this, and which require, you know, community service and stuff like that. It never goes uh, on your record. All right. Well, that's good. Um, and so that, that's not a bad program. And then, obviously, if uh, another arrest will result in you going to the juvenile court. Now, when you turn 18, all the juvenile stuff is erased, uh, you know, and everybody needs to understand that. But, you know, the, the crime, the, the punishment has to fit the crime. And, mm. you know, if you get caught larceny, obviously restitution and, uh, you know, some community service would work and, and, you know, things like that. But, you know, when you're on your 10th, yeah, 15th, yeah, yeah. Your twentieth. It, it's time. It's time. Something needs to happen. I I agree. I'm just trying to find the balance of what's fair. And and look, I I know as as an adult, I I had friends of mine who, you know, were less than desirable. 
um, when we were in high school and, and did some stupid things, and they turned out to be pretty, pretty, you know, well-adjusted adults with, uh, mm-hmm. um, you know, great careers. And I would just hate to know that, you know, one stupid mistake that they did if they, you know, rip something off at a convenience store just is going to, you know, prevent them from pursuing something as a mature adult. Uh, but we're talking about something entirely different than stealing a, right. a candy bar at a at a convenience store. We're talking about you know theft and 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 a, and a much more severe crime. What what do the what does the majority party in our state legislature? How do they justify that uh, closing these prisons and 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 not only just closing of the prisons but also not. Um, or allowing multiple convictions of juveniles, how do they justify that as being okay and acceptable? They've got constituents that they need to answer to as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's something that I keep hearing about is, is you know, that you know, once they're done their sentences, they have to move on with their lives too, and and we don't want to hold them hold them back. Uh, and I understand that. But you can't keep letting somebody out. You can't keep letting them go so that they, they have other victims, you know, across the state. Uh, mm-hmm. I think when you when you take some of these career criminals and you add up the damage that they've done to the to to victims across the state, you add up the monetary that it's taken to to send them through the court system and the police time. I think you know it kind of equals out over them actually going to jail for a short time. Hopefully, teaching them a lesson that way. But even in our prisons, I, I, I just want to make sure that even if somebody goes to prison, that the opportunities are there that, you know, through counseling and everything else, that they, they have an opportunity when they do come out. But um, do you, really need to. Yeah, I agree. I think more people need to need to come out and speak out on this. Do you think that the law will be strengthened in the state of Connecticut? It just seems that the majority Democrats who run the state capitol are more concerned with the behavior of police rather than yeah. the repeat criminals who steal people's property. I, I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you there. I mean, we there's so much uh, uh, negativity going towards the police right now, and there's still stuff in, in coming right now uh, in, through this legislative process. So the cops are bad, but the people who are perpetrating crime, they get free passes. This is what the Democrats in our state capital are trying to tell us, right? I mean, I, yeah. I can't make heads or yeah. tails of that. I don't know how to make sense out of that. I don't either. Oh, jeez. Well, listen, that statement that uh, that you offered in the hearing, quote, in the state of Connecticut, if you do the crime, you don't do the time, end quote. I mean, that's a pretty powerful statement, especially since it comes from you, a former police officer, Senator. Yeah. That, I'm, I'm sure that resonated. I hope it resonated. Yeah. I don't think it did. Not with, uh, uh, you know, the, the Republicans are doing what we can to, to keep law and order in Connecticut and, uh, you know, it, it, every time I look, turn around, it just looks like the Democrats are not doing that. And, and it's terrible. What caused them to get so off track? I mean, moderate Democrats were like, yeah, you know, uh, you, you can you can have some overlapping commonalities. But it just seems mm-hmm. like the more progressive wing, which has been more dominant, has gone so far left that no one, the average person, even the person who's not even political, you know, the apolitical, let's say, even they don't agree with that stuff. But yet this is what we're being forced to swallow. Yeah, it's the same. It, it really is. All right. Uh, State Senator Dan Champagne. Listen, I really appreciate your time with us this morning and your perspective. Uh, also, the mayor of the town of Vernon, a former police officer for the town of Vernon. I mean, if there's anything that's right in your wheelhouse, uh, it's this. Please keep us posted as this uh, bill uh, furthers through the legislative process. We look forward to having you.